Mike Winger is a well-respected Christian teacher and host of the Bible Thinker online ministry. Mike has produced several videos which not only seek to defend PSA, but argue that it is historical and central to the Christian gospel. We strongly disagree and believe it is necessary to present a sincere and well-reasoned counter-argument for both Mike and his followers to consider. We do not want this disagreement to be a source of division. Both Bible Thinker and Idol Killer are dedicated to Christ and the truth of Scripture. It is our hope that this will serve to mend divisions and bring the body of Christ into a deeper love and understanding of the goodness of God. Well, hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to destroying sacred cows for the cause of Christ. I'm your host, Warren McGrew, and you're joining us in our continuing little response series here to uh, Pastor Mike Winger and uh, his teaching on penal substitutionary atonement. And joining me for the entirety of this program is none other than Paul Vonderdy, the dapper gentleman himself, the man with the uh, the best wardrobe in in all of uh, Christian YouTube. Paul, welcome to uh, welcome to Idol Killer. Well, thanks for those encomiums, but now I'll need to get a bigger hat to accommodate my expanding ego. That's right. That's right. So, so let's uh, let's go ahead and and dive in today. We're looking at the big one, the the silver bullet in the penal substitutionary atonement. There, there, there. The atonement schools arsenal, Isaiah fifty three. Right. <laughs> Isaiah 53, yes. And Warren, in our last two shows, I think we just about overdosed on atonement school wrath and hatred. We're going to try to remedy that today with God's love and healing. To the chagrin of the atonement school, we're going to draw that love and healing from Isaiah 53. The reason why atonement schoolers like Mike Winger will be chagrined at that is because Isaiah 53 is what is known as a chair passage for them. A chair passage is any chapter containing the largest concentration of teaching on this or that doctrine. For example, 1 Corinthians 15, that's the chair passage for bodily resurrection. Philippians 2, that's the chair passage for the incarnation. And Isaiah 53 is for them the chair passage for PSA. The Protestant scholar Walt Kaiser from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary tells us that the main burden of doctrinal teaching rests upon the chair passages. The bottom line is Isaiah 53, or at least the Atonement School's interpretation of it, is the cornerstone of atonement theology. It is the cornerstone of PSA. And if their interpretation is wrong, then their entire theology crumbles. Before we move any further, it would be well for us to listen to Isaiah 53 in its entirety. It actually includes part of chapter 52, and it's also known as the Suffering Servant Passage or the Fourth Servant Song. I'll be referring to it by all three terms throughout this interview. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished that the, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Chapter 53 Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That was our alleged chair passage for PSA. Young Mr. Winger, in the third of his videos, spends an hour and ten minutes dissecting that passage. Here's how he pompously characterizes his analysis. Anyway, I, I think that it all works together. It all works together. And that's the beautiful thing. The view I'm, I'm bringing to you, it incorporates all of Scripture, Old and New Testament. You're kind of rolling your eyes there. You know, Paul, I, I, I used to believe that. I used to believe that penal substitutionary atonement was the singular understanding for the work of Christ and that it beautifully wove together the Old Testament messianic prophecies with the New Testament revelation of who the Messiah is. And that's what I believe. Until I started actually reading my Bible and saying, do I understand what the text is saying or am I just assuming that I do? And I started to try and become a good Berean and set aside my bias and then I realized I'm in trouble. My atonement theory, like so much of my reformed uh, soteriology and theology, is completely absent from the text. I'm bringing that to it. And um, and so, yeah, I, I hear Mike saying this and I relate to it uh, for all the wrong reasons. So, I, I, again, I may be getting some criticism for being too kind and, and, and too ecumenical with, uh, with Brother Winger over there but it's because I sympathize to the stumbling uh, that, that these doctrines are, are causing him to go through because I've lived it. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can excuse it. It doesn't mean that we condone it, but, uh, but I do get it. The real difficulty that I have with Mike Winger's analysis is that it's overconfident. There is a learning and memorization expert named Jim Quick. He's aptly named because he specializes in speed reading. Jim Quick tells us that the first rule when approaching any topic is forget everything you know about that topic. It is better to approach something with a spirit of bewilderment than it is to approach it with a spirit of overconfidence. Because when a person is overconfident toward a text or a subject matter, that person sets up a block to learning anything new about it or seeing it in a different light. I think that's what is, uh, what's happened with Mike Winger here. He's so overconfident that he refers to his interpretation of Isaiah 53 as, quote, beautiful. Then he says very overconfidently that his view incorporates all of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In reality, it comes nowhere near doing that. Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs. If Mike Winger's analysis is so thorough, then where are the other three servant songs? In fact, he doesn't even cover all of Isaiah 53 in this video. Uh, when it comes to Isaiah 52, 13 through 14, he reads the passages to us, but he gives no exegesis of them. Isaiah 53, one through three, again, he reads it, but with no, I, I, no exegesis. 
And finally, Isaiah 53, 7 through 9, same thing. He reads the passage but gives no exegesis. The only parts of Isaiah 53 that he analyzes are 52, 15, 53, 4 through 6, 53, 10 through 12, and that's it. And as far as his analysis incorporating the entirety of the New Testament, he doesn't even read to us Matthew 8, 16 through 17, which is the New Testament's commentary on Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Isn't that a rather glaring omission? A lot of people, a lot of people in the atonement school are not even aware of, of the New Testament coming in and expounding upon Isaiah 53. They think Isaiah 53 is clouded in mystery and has to be, you know, interpreted. But the, the New Testament tells us a, a great deal about it. It tells us a great deal about it very succinctly. We're going to get to that verse a little bit later on. For now, though, I would like to roll clip 12C, and this is where Mike Winger continues with his amazing overconfidence. And there is one passage that the anti-PSA individuals always avoid, or they dismiss it after only commenting on one verse or one part of one verse in this whole chapter, in this whole section. This one passage is what they avoid. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's live stream. That's the idea. Also, I'm going to be getting into the weeds. The debate of penal substitution, that is, I'm, it's going to be a little complicated because I'm not just going to preach, here's my opinion. I'm going to bring up objections to my position because I've been looking long and hard. And it's hard to find them because most of the guys who are against penal substitution, they will never talk about Isaiah 53 except for a verse, maybe one verse, or maybe they'll casually mention stuff, but they never go deep into it. Um, so, but I had to look really hard to find where they would actually build their case against my case. So I'm going to interact with that. So it's going to be maybe a challenge a little bit for some to follow this video, but it might actually really help people who feel like they've been caught in the weeds and this might be your way out. At least that's my hope. Now, what, what are some of the, um, the rebuttals to this stuff? I've saved some rebuttals. Um, generally the, the, the stuff you'll hear most often, they will not even deal with the verses I've brought you today. They're not even going to handle them. Um, unfortunately, cause I looked everywhere and I mean, I asked people that know theology, you know, they know this stuff. And I was like, can you think of anybody who deals with verse by verse through Isaiah 53 to explain how this is not penal substitution, like anybody. And they generally don't. He, he's saying that we always avoid Isaiah 53. Is that, is that his claim? Paul? He says we avoid Isaiah 53 or we simply look at parts of it. Yeah. Which is I mean, exactly what he did. That's that. Yeah, exactly. That, that's yeah. pot calling the kettle black there. Um, yeah, well, let's come I, in. And maybe, maybe, maybe the people, you know, let's give me the benefit of the doubt. Maybe the people he looked at were, you know, some tie dye wearing hippie progressives that um, are living in a commune with their, you know, polyamorous significant others. And uh, they did a horrible job exegeting this. Maybe, maybe those are the sources he looked at. Um, we, we don't. We don't commit that. I mean, we're, we're showing that today. We're digging deep. We're dedicating an entire episode to it. What troubles me is he says he's been looking, quote, long and hard, end quote, for non-PSA analyses of Isaiah 53. Then he ends that clip saying that he asked all of his most theologically astute friends, hey, do you know anyone who shows how Isaiah 53 is not PSA? For Mike Winger's information, I did a rather long series critiquing PSA and dedicated three entire episodes just to Isaiah 53. The date on those three shows was 2013, meaning they came out six years prior to Mike Winger's series on PSA. The date on his series, if I'm not mistaken, is 2019. In 2019, all of my recordings on PSA were still available on YouTube. When I put those up, I was very careful to put in all the metadata, all the special keywords like atonement, vicarious atonement, penal substitutionary atonement, satisfaction theory of the atonement, Anselm, you name it, I put it in the metadata. So in 2019, if he had done a search on YouTube, he very likely would have found my materials, which tells me he didn't look long and hard at all. Well, I, I remember back then, uh, looking on on Google and YouTube and doing a search, because as I was coming to question this, this was around, I want to say 20, 2015 ish, 2014, 2015, uh, I started to really dig deep into this. And uh, I remember going, I don't know where to look. 
because I was, I was isolated in my own bubble, my own echo chamber. And Google, Google helped me out just doing a keyword search, spending about, you know, 30 minutes. I was able to find various series. I asked my friends online, they mentioned you and sure enough, I get on YouTube, I do a quick search and there you are. So I, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, this gave me the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he didn't ask the right people. Maybe he didn't do the right keyword. I, I don't know, but it, it's, it's been out there. Yeah, at this point, I'm getting where I'm a lot less generous in giving him the benefit of the doubt because there's too much overconfidence in his presentations. Enough said on that. Let's move on right into the meat of Isaiah 53. We'll start in chapter 52, which is where the ser servant song actually begins. We're going to look at clip 12D. This begins Mike Winger's analysis. Uh, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of men. So he's just, he's beat up, he's marred, he's all that. It, it goes on in verse 15 and tells us, So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. That which has not been told them they see, that which they have not heard they understand. This... Okay, there's a lot here, but I'm, I'm focusing on the PSA kind of elements, penal substitutionary atonement. And there's one in particular that stands out, and it's this word sprinkle. It's this word sprinkle. This, this is kind of a big deal. Um, that word sprinkle in the context of in consistently and constantly in the Old Testament, that word is used to refer to sprinkling um, like, like when you sprinkle water or oil or blood on something. In the Levitical law and relation to sacrifices, and we'll see Isaiah 53 is all about the Levitical law and sacrifices. It's all connected. Um, in relation specifically to the law and sacrifices, the term sprinkle is used to refer to when they would say sacrifice an animal and take the blood and sprinkle it on the altar, sprinkle it on the tent, sprinkle it over here, sprinkle it over there. And it was meant to be covering the sins or dealing with the sins of the people. So the significance of this if, if we're interpreting it right, sprinkle is reference to a sacrificial thing. And we'll see later, Isaiah 53, we have a lot of support for this. Then this sprinkling of the suffering servant of Jesus is going to sprinkle not just Israel, but many nations. It's going to be a atoning thing for lots of nations around. All right, Mike Winger ended that analysis telling us, quote, Isaiah 53 is all about the Levitical laws and sacrifices, end quote. I would suggest that Mike Winger take a broader look at the entire book of Isaiah. In the opening chapter, we read this, quote, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. End of that passage. And then the very last chapter in Isaiah, we read this. Quote, he that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood, end quote. Since God Almighty bookends the scroll of Isaiah with condemnations of animal sacrifice, I highly doubt that Isaiah 53 is God waxing lyrical about animal sacrifice? Isaiah 52 and 53, moreover, are prophecies of Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth hates the Levitical sacrifices, and he hates the temple that they occur in. Think about all the times Jesus appears in the temple. He's brought in as a child, and all of a sudden there's this disturbance with these two old prophets coming out of the woodwork. You have the, the prophet coming out and the prophet is coming out and making these disrupting statements about this child. Then uh, when Christ is 12 years old, he's in the temple questioning the priests and the scholars of the law. I like to speculate that he's questioning them. Why do you have these animal sacrifices when it says all through the prophets that this is worthless? And then when Christ is running his ministry for the last three years of his life on at least two occasions, he cleanses the temple, driving out all the money changers and all the animals, basically making it impossible to offer sacrifices. So 
when Mike Winger says that this is all about the sprinkling of the blood in the Levitical sacrifices, I strongly dispute that. In my estimation, this is probably more like a reference to Exodus 24. And we can listen to that passage from Exodus 24. This is clip 12E. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. What's happening in that passage from Exodus 24 is the ratification of the covenant at Mount Sinai. God is making an exclusive covenant with the nation of Israel. That covenant is sealed with the blood of oxen. In my opinion, and in the opinion of certain Egyptologists and other people I've read, the reason they are sprinkled with the blood of the oxen is so that they cannot return to Egypt because they are covered with the blood of their most precious gods. The Egyptians had three bulls that they worshipped. They had Apis, Menevis, and Bucus. Each of these bulls was considered a living god. So what's happening here is God is sprinkling them, the Israelites, with the blood of Apis, Menevis, and Bucus so they can't turn around. Again, this is an exclusive covenant between God and one nation. Christ makes God available, so to speak, to all nations. And that's what's happening in Isaiah 53 when it says he shall sprinkle many nations. In other words, God is going to ratify a covenant now with the Gentiles. This is no longer a strictly Hebrew affair. It's, I mean, it's very fascinating whenever you, you stop and you consider these things in a, in a light you know, that, that you, haven't, uh, you haven't really been exposed to before. And the idea that Jesus, this, this, this coming Messiah, the, the coming Redeemer, the coming Rescuer, the one who's going to save us from, from death itself, um, and you get this idea that men were afraid of death, that it was holding them in, in bondage, and this sprinkling not only is saving us from false gods, but fear of futility and death itself. It's, um, it's a very powerful image, and a, I think a much more uh, holistic and... and um, uh, uh, encompassing of both, like, like, like Mike was trying to claim, uh, encompassing of both the Old and New Testament. I think this is the understanding that accomplishes that, not penal substitutionary atonement. I'm delighted that you drew upon Hebrews, the second chapter, uh, for what you just said there, because Hebrews is, in the opinion of the uh, atonement school, especially chapters seven through nine, yet another one of their chair verses. In a subsequent interview, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews and show that it, in fact, is not a chair, a chair passage for them either. Warren, let's move on to Isaiah 53, four. Isaiah 53, four in the King James reads, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Let's roll cl uh, clip 12F. This is Mike Winger's interpretation of that. Okay, now it's getting into the, the important stuff for today's case here. Verse 4, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now let me pause right here and say um, griefs and sorrows and carrying these things for in the context of Isaiah, this is where we need to recognize the book has a context. Isaiah is written to a people who are suffering under God's judgment or punishment for their sins. They're grieved and they're full of sorrow and they need to be healed, but yet there is, and they need peace, but they don't have it because God says there's no peace for the wicked. Throughout Isaiah, they're afflicted, they're, they're just being wrecked. And it's, it's not just because they're oppressed by bad guys. They are oppressed by bad guys. But the reason is because of their sin. And so in context of Isaiah 53, um, or in context of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 4, the, him bearing our griefs, these griefs are the result of God's punishment on their sin, and this man is bearing them. That's the context of the, um, the chapter in the whole book and in the whole Old Testament. Paul, um, I mean, Mike is saying like, hey, here's a verse that uh, people who don't adhere to PSA 
will latch on. They ignore everything else, but they latch on to this. And uh, and then you see him. It, it, it almost seems like. Um, do you remember? Do you remember the uh, the street art where they'll put like a, a ball under a series of cups and they'll move them around. And while you're not looking, they palm one of the the balls so that no matter what cup you choose, you're going to lose your bet. I picked up right. on a little bit of that, and I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it, it doesn't seem like he ad- ac- accurately or um, sufficiently handled the objection that we're raising. That it that it is a corrective statement. Like we thought this, but we thought this. Yet these are correctives, and it doesn't seem like he's sufficiently engaging in that. Yeah, th- that's my position too. Exactly what you said. So Mr. Winger accuses us of ignoring Isaiah fifty three in toto, or just ignoring parts thereof. I would like to point out that he's ignoring one word in Isaiah fifty three four. That's the word yet. Yet is a conjunction. Conjunctions are words like and, but, yet that connect either two sentences or two clauses within a sentence. What happens when you say yet, when you use that conjunction, that means that clause B either modifies or completely reverses clause A. In the case of Isaiah 53, 4, the conjunction is yet. It is not and. Again, the passage reads, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That's clause A. Yet, here's our conjunction that's reversing that. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. If Mike Winger's interpretation of Isaiah 53, 4 is correct, then the conjunction would have to be and. In other words, clause A, bearing griefs and carrying sorrows, equals clause B, being smitten of God and afflicted. Sadly for Mr. Winger, the conjunction is yet. In other words, clause A, bearing griefs and carrying sorrows, does not equal clause B, being smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God and afflicted is the onlooker's wrong perception of the suffering servant's condition. In fact, this kind of structure happens all throughout the prophets, the book of Psalms, and the book of Proverbs. It's a, it's a literary device called antithetic parallelism. Antithetic parallelism. I'm shocked, appalled, and dismayed that the Bible thinker doesn't know this. When, when you're coming in and you're saying we're ignoring Psalm 53, and then you go to one of the points that, that our, our side would make and, and, and note this corrective statement, and then to turn around and, and, and disregard the whole point that we've made, essentially, and, and continue on like it is an and or a continuation, um, it, there, there is no there's no response from Mike here. It's more of, um, of, of a hand waving and dismissal than it is an actual refutation or engagement. Um, and and I, I'm just I'm not convinced by his handling of that at all. In Eastern Christianity, the understanding of the phrase, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, is that this simply means Christ became incarnate. He took upon himself the damaged human condition, which involves grief, which involves sorrow, which involves pain, so on and so forth. And Warren, you will never guess who actually agrees with the Eastern Church on this. Any guesses? Um... Well, I mean, I, I do. <laughs> okay. We don't continue. We don't consider you an atonement schooler, though. No, no, so no, me, no. That, that's correct. Let me break the news here. So it would be this man, John MacArthur. And it's in this book, this book, which is called The Gospel According to God. This book is a book length exposition, uh, explication of Isaiah 53, the fourth servant song. And on page 96 of this book, John MacArthur tells us this regarding Isaiah 53, 4. Again, page 96, quote, The word translated griefs in that verse is a broad term that can also mean sickness, infirmity, or calamity, end quote. See, and this is, this is the thing that I don't think the atonement school even really considers. And that is the entire point of the incarnation. There's, there's such an emphasis on the suffering, the brutality, the, the death of the cross. That's where they focus. So they miss out on the incarnation, the life, the ministry, the teaching, all of that. Even, even the ascension, 
the resurrection and ascension, because for PSA, the, the, the heart of PSA is that Christ is pouring his, I mean, the, the father's pouring his wrath out on Christ on the cross. So they, they ignore the redemptive work of actually assuming our nature. And this is partly because they hold to an Augustinian anthropology where they have to deny the biblical description of the incarnation, lest they corrupt it with, you know, this original sin, this concupiscence or total depravity. And so it's this disjointed understanding that causes them to pretty much jettison the redemptive work of the incarnation. Right. If the nature that Christ, if the nature that the second person of the Trinity takes on to himself is not the same nature that we have, then our nature is not healed. This just becomes, I mean, the whole incarnation just becomes a sham. Warren, let's continue with Mike Winger's analysis of Isaiah 53. Four, this is, I believe, clip 12G. But then they go on and they say, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. And this is going to be an important important verse to debate on uh, along with verse five but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed now here's where um, this is uh, you know most of the time they don't deal with isaiah 53 the anti-penal substitution guys I, they just ignore it i in my experience i'm not saying i can't speak for everybody i'm saying the guys i've encountered the people i've been able to access and i've looked and looked and looked most of them, they don't deal with Isaiah 53, but they always, if they do deal with it, they always hook on verse 4 and make this almost their whole case. Um, yet we esteem, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Here's what they want to say. We thought Jesus was being punished, but he wasn't being punished. That's what verse 4 is saying. Um, it wasn't God who did it. We punished Jesus. We hurt him, but it wasn't from God. And here's where I'm, we're going to encounter this over and over again with those who deny penal substitution. I can agree oftentimes with what they affirm, but I can't agree with what they deny. I will affirm we attacked Christ. We sought to, you know, we as a people sought to punish him. Uh, but I can't affirm what they deny. They deny it wasn't God. God didn't do it. God didn't have this in mind. It wasn't some sort of plan of God's in that sense of directly causing these things. And there I have to deny that. Um, and that's going to be the case. Constantly, they're giving these us these false dilemmas, and we're we're, we're saying us that's not that's not the way it is. You know, Paul, I think I think there's a bit of a straw man that's going on here too, because it seems to be, and, and I don't think Mike is the only one that I've heard this from. I, I hear this from a lot of atonement schoolers, where they'll come in and they'll say, "You're denying that God was at work in the redemption of man." through Christ Jesus, his, his incarnation, life, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension. We're not denying that God was at work here. We're saying that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were of one mind, one purpose, one intent, that was to heal, redeem, restore, deliver, to, to call mankind to himself, to restore that, that image, that icon that he had created called man, and that God was at work there. But well, I think what they're doing is, is a little bit of a straw man and a little bit of begging the question, because unless you agree that the father was the one desiring to punish, that the father was the one who could not freely forgive, but had to pour his wrath on Christ, then you're denying that God was at work here. And I think that's a little bit more of sleight of hand that, that Mike is engaged in. And that's not our position. We're not saying God isn't at work. We're saying Christ is God. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. They're of one mind, one purpose. No greater love has a man than he laid down his life for his friends. It was the love of God that precipitated this, not God's inability to forgive. And I think that Mike is, is engaged in a little bit of uh, fallacious reasoning there. They have to be careful, too, because there are some notable Protestants who say something very similar to what you and I are saying. We're going to see Gilbert Patterson in this next clip. I believe we're looking at clip 12H. Didn't nobody have to fight but one person, but the nation gained a vicarious victory. Tell somebody a vicarious victory. That's what I'm looking for today. I'm asking the prophet Isaiah, why? Would they do him in such a manner? But Isaiah said, I want you to know, surely he's borne our grief, carried our sorrow, yet we did esteem him stricken, 
smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgression. He didn't do any evil. He did no guile. No sin, no guile was found in his mouth. But when they nailed his hand, it was to take care of the healing in your hand and in your arm. When they nailed his feet, it was to take care of your swollen feet and fallen arches and all of the trouble in your ankles and anything that happens in your leg. When they put a crown on his head, it was to take care of your migraine headaches and, and to take care of anything that happened in the region of your head. When they spit him in the side, it was to take care of your appendix problem and your stomach problem and anything that would happen in the torso area. And it was to take care of your wounded and your broken heart. Wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes can I hear somebody say with his stripes victory is is when somebody else fights and gives me the victory thanks be unto God thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord The person we saw in that clip was a well-known Protestant bishop named Gilbert E. Patterson from the Church of God in Christ, Kojic. Gilbert Patterson is analyzing in that clip Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, and in fact, they even printed it on the screen while he was speaking. When Gilbert Patterson looks at that passage, the same one that Mike Winger just looked at, Patterson sees something vicarious going on. But it's not vicarious punishment. It's not vicarious atonement. Rather, what he sees is vicarious victory. That's Christus Victor model. When he gets into a, a little further into that sermon, he talks about how the, the crown of thorns on, on the head of Christ is healing us of our migraines and our early onset dementia. When he talks about the nail in the hands, that's where Christ is healing us of our arthritis. The nail in the feet, that's healing us of our plantar fasciitis. The spear in the side, that's healing our gut inflammation and our cirrhosis of the liver. This is restored icon model. So this well-known Protestant pastor is telling us that Isaiah 53 is about vicarious victory and vicarious healing, not about vicarious atonement. Now, Mike Winger said that he looked long and hard for anyone who had a non-atonement school approach to Isaiah 53. Well, has he never heard of Gilbert Patterson? Gilbert Patterson is a celebrated Protestant bishop. When Patterson was still living, he was on TBN almost every week. We are not talking about an obscure personality here. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's there. You just have to be willing to, to look for it. Right. So now, Warren, we got to ask ourselves a question. We have two views of Isaiah 53 here. We've got Mike Winger's and we got Gil Patterson's. Which one is right? Are we simply going to pick the one that we like best, the one that suits our biases best? Well, that's not good biblical scholarship. 
The Protestants themselves tell us that the Bible interprets the Bible. So let's listen now to the passage that we referred to earlier. That's the passage, Matthew 8, verses 14 through 17. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that was sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities, and bare our sicknesses. There we have it. That's what the New Testament says about Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. It tells us that it is fulfilled when Christ heals people and casts out their demons sickness, decrepitude, demon possessions, these are all symptoms of the damaged human condition. Thus, Isaiah 53 is all about Christ assuming to himself a damaged human condition and thereby healing it. Amazingly, though, Mike Winger tells us next to nothing about Matthew chapter 8. Here is the to sum total of what he says about it. Now, let's talk about how the New Testament authors use the Septuagint, because what you will commonly hear, and, I, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar, I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar, but I, I've done a lot of homework on this, and I'm trying to bring it to you guys in a way that will help you out. And from what I understand, a lot of people assume that the New Testament authors, they not only use the Septuagint, but that they pretty much exclusively use the Septuagint. And then they, and if the Septuagint differs from the Hebrew, then the New Testament guys, they would have agreed with the Septuagint. And that's where I think the deception is, or the mistake is. The New Testament authors often quote loosely from the Septuagint. Sometimes they just make their own translations. And one example is Matthew 8, 17. Matthew 8, 17, he actually quotes from Isaiah 53. What's interesting, most agree, Matthew is not using the Septuagint. He makes his own Greek translation that's closer to the Hebrew, meaning that Matthew prefers the Hebrew in, in Matthew 8, 17. So to say that we need to take the Septuagint and use it when Matthew didn't seem like he was stuck to that, it would be a mistake. So, so essentially, um, Mike's handling of the New Testament exegesis of Isaiah is to say, don't look to the Septuagint because the Septuagint is bad because um, he doesn't like the interpretation. He doesn't like the application because it's contrary to PSA. I mean, what, what is, what's his, his point here in attacking the Septuagint? Well, um, I think it's just that. It's a distraction because the, whether you're using the Septuagint or whether you're using the Masoretic is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is the Gospel of Matthew quotes Isaiah and then tells you what it means. Mike Winger doesn't, not only, he doesn't exegete the passage and moreover doesn't even read it. So basically, all we know is that Matthew chapter 8, verse 7 is an instance of how uh, the, the ancient Greek translation is bad, but we learn nothing about uh, Matthew 8, 7 itself. In that clip, Mike Winger referred to himself as saying that he's not a scholar. That's one of the few times I would agree with Mike Winger. But beyond that, I want to point out that he's not alone in this strategy of simply ignoring Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses 4. 14 through 17. We're turning again to the Gospel According to God, the book that I held up earlier by John MacArthur. This book is entirely about Isaiah 53. You would think that a book-length exposition of Isaiah 53 would say something in depth about Matthew 8. In fact, John MacArthur mentions it only twice. The first time is on page 13. That's it right there. Tiny print and a footnote. This is the sum total of what he writes. Matthew 8, 17 quotes Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. That's all he tells us. The second time he mentions it is on page 36. Down here at the bottom, he has a bulleted list of all the New Testament references to Isaiah 53. Again, all he writes, Matthew 8, 17 quotes 53, 4. So in a book that deals exclusively with Isaiah 53. We have two references to Matthew 8, and in both instances, they're basically just throwaway footnotes. You know, the New Testament references it. Okay, move on, nothing to see here. No interpretation, no application, no understanding, no context. Let's just move along. What? What? This is this, and yet, and yet we're accused of glossing over Isaiah 53? 
like our side is accused of it, it's just you know um it does it doesn't seem to be honest or fair uh i'll leave it at that i'll leave it at that too warren let's move on to the next verse we're looking at isaiah 53 5 here's how it reads but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed Let's roll clip 12K, which is Mike Winger's analysis of that passage. Um, they, uh, they say he was pierced what, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And then it just makes it even more clear. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Chastisement that brought us peace. Now, here's where I did some major homework on the word chastisement. Did you know chastisement? is in the prophets, in the prophets of the Old Testament, it's always affliction from God. It's not affliction from man. And that's what the anti-PSA crowd wants to say. Um, no, we, you know, we sinned against him. That's how he's pierced for our transgressions. We, 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 we hurt him. It's just saying we sinned against him. But it's not saying that, right? It's saying that there was a chastening upon him and it was the chastening that brought us peace. Remember Israel, they get no peace for the wicked. Jesus, he suffers for them. Now they can have peace. Why? Because the punishment or the chastening they deserved, it went on Christ. That's what this passage seems to be clearly teaching. When I say chastening is in the prophets, always affliction from God. Let me give you a list of examples. You might want to write these down. Isaiah 26, verse 16. That's it used in Isaiah. This passage, 53, 5. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3. Jeremiah 7, 28. Jeremiah 10, 8. Jeremiah 17, 23. 30 verse 14, 32 verse 33, 35 verse 13, Ezekiel 5 15, Hosea 5 2, Zephaniah 3 2, Zephaniah 3 7. That's every occurrence of the word in the prophets, always in the context of God bringing suffering upon people as a result of their sin. Musar is, is the word that's translated as, as chastisement, and it basically means instruction. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean necessarily punitive. The chastisement angle of that is something I would need to look into a little more uh, thoroughly. What struck me most about Mike Winger's statement there is when he's reading Isaiah 53, 5, he leaves off of it the most celebrated clause, the most celebrated part of the verse. That's the very last part, which reads, and with his stripes, we are healed. If Mike Winger's analysis of Isaiah 53, 5, or his analysis of the entire suffering servant passage is right, that should read something like, by his stripes, we are exonerated. It does not read that. It is not judicial terminology. It is medical terminology. It's not about being pardoned. It's about being healed. This is something very, very interesting, too, when one looks at translations of the divine liturgy in Eastern Orthodoxy. Generally speaking, the English translations don't say for the forgiveness of our sins or anything like that. Rather, they say for the remission of sins. In Eastern Christian thinking, sin is like a disease. And when Christ heals us, that disease goes into remission. So there are some senses here where we're being kind of tossed and turned by curiosities of the English language. But the Eastern Orthodox Church, which uses Greek as its language, when they translate this into English, they prefer remission over forgiveness. I also want to point something out, too, to Mr. Winger. If this is all about judicial pardon and not about healing, which is what we say, then he's missing the thrust of Isaiah as a whole. The man, Isaiah, we're talking not about the book, but the prophet, the prophet himself is associated with healing. His, uh, his uh, prophetic career spanned such a long period of time that there were at least four kings who reigned in Judah during his, uh, pro his prophetic career. One of those kings was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was slated to die, but God sent Isaiah to him and added 15 years to his life. Does that strike you as something judicial or does it strike you as gracious healing? This this application or this interpretation of Isaiah 53 completely ignores the whole intent. It goes, oh, stripes. I know what that means. God God was angry and God hurt him. It, it, it's, it's, it, what it does, it's, it's like a dog whistle. It, it triggers you to go, oh, I know what that means. 
So you stop thinking, you stop reading, you stop considering it. Warren, let's move on to our next passage. That's Isaiah 53, 6. I'll read it from the King James. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mike Winger's analysis of it follows. This is clip 12L. So this is sin-bearing language three times, and this is terminology from the Levitical law. Let's look at some of those passages. I want, I want to show you how this phrase, sin-bearing, or uh, lay the sin upon him, this is huge for understanding what Isaiah is talking about and how it's a sacrificial death that this guy... Jesus, man. Jesus is going to experience. In Leviticus 5.1... We read this. This is what sin bearing means in the in the mind of the Israelite, in the mind of Isaiah, as he's writing this. If anyone sins, um, in that he hears a public adoration to testify, and though he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter, yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. What does that mean? It means he's he's guilty. Like he's going to be in a state of guilt before God, and legally, this is the context in Leviticus, and specifically, there's like a juridical or legal guilt that the man faces. Um, in the eyes of the law, the Levitical law, because he did that. This guy, Jesus, I love that. Let me reread part of that passage. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. As we discussed in a previous interview, that too is explicated in the New Testament. It appears in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it is embedded in the context of a moral exemplar model. So he's already got a problem there. He went on to uh, Leviticus chapter 5. That's not going to avail him anything either. Let's play a portion of Leviticus 5. This is clip 12. And it shall be, when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass which he hath committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And he shall bring them unto the priest, who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first, and wring off his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder. And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the manner. And the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. Then shall he bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It is a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as touching his sin that he hath sinned in one of these, and it shall be forgiven him. If we listened carefully to that passage from Leviticus 5, we find that the first thing a person is told to offer for this or that sin is a lamb or a kid. We're then told that the offering of that lamb or kid brings atonement. Then the next portion of the, uh, of the passage, it tells us, if the person cannot afford a lamb or a kid, then bring two pigeons or two turtle doves, and that will make atonement. Then it goes on to say, if the person can't afford even two pigeons, then just bring one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour. Well, I'm sorry to break the news to Mr. Winger, but an ephah of fine flour is not a blood offering. There's no way you're going to get blood out of flour. So if flour offers the same level of atonement as all of these other things, pigeons, or then you go to the more expensive ones, sheep or goats, well, then this whole animal sacrifice thing starts to crumble. Isaiah 53 is not about animal sacrifice, and it is not about Christ fulfilling those sacrifices. Very well said, Paul. Very well said. And I, I, I think that that's clear from anyone who can who can dig into the text and it doesn't have an axe to grind. Warren, let's move on to our next passage. This is Isaiah 53, verse 10. It reads, again from the King James, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. 
When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. If we roll clip 12 in, as in November, we'll see Mike Winger's interpretation of that. But keep in mind that word crushed is used one more time, and that's in Isaiah 53, verse 10. So let's zoom down there. We'll, we'll come back up in a minute. Where it says it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And he has put him to grief. This is the agency. This is the one doing the crushing. It was human, human involvement, but yet ultimately you zoom out and you see the sovereignty of God. It was God's will and he crushed. And it's the same Hebrew word, right? He was crushed by our iniquities. Well, now we can go and say, well, how did that work? Because it was God's will to crush him. Because God has put him to grief. So this is an active, God is active in the, in the, uh, in the crushing, in the, in, in the death of Christ, in the sacrifice of Christ. He is taking an active role. That's the idea we're getting. Uh, so yeah, it's see. definitely there. Um, now there's more in verse 10 because it says it was actually God's will to crush him. Now this is, this is kind of a big deal, um, because they're going to, the anti-PSA crowd really want to say it wasn't, God did not have any agency, any causal force in what happened to Jesus on the cross. It was purely a human thing. He just, he pulled it, he pulled back and he allowed man to beat up Jesus to show us that he could just take it and forgive us anyways. And there's, now there's an element of truth to that, but is that the whole story? No, it was actually God's will to crush him. That's the idea. And to kind of drive this home in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews in Isaiah 53, 10, <clears throat> it is he that put him to grief. It, it's, it's God who put him to grief. So God is causally involved. The father is causally involved, right? The son is causally involved in the things on the cross. Like these, the, there is no, there's no disagreement in the, in the Godhead on what's happening on the cross. The Reverend Mr. Winger tells us about agency. Amazingly, he doesn't understand some of the basic theological tools used to explain agency. Protestant systematic theologians and apologists always distinguish between God's active will and his passive will. All throughout the Bible, when God allows somebody to do something, even if it is evil, that's said to be God's passive will. He's allowing this evil action to take place so that his will can be accomplished. So God can operate through either instrumentality, either through active will or passive will. And this is admitted by two of the big names in Protestant apologetics. We're gonna hear the legendary Walter Martin and we're going to hear one of his disciples, Ken Samples. God permits evil for his sovereign purposes. That is, not everything that God allows is what God sovereignly uh, wants to happen, but he allows it. God has a passive will along with an active will. An almighty deity decides to allow free moral choice in his creation so that spirits and men may be truly free to love him rather than robots who reflect only his will by being programmed to respond to his stimuli. By definition, the deity is beneficent. Therefore, by allowing freedom which he, which produced evil, he is at once all-powerful and good, because he causes the evil that arises from free choice and will from men and angels to work out his perfect sovereign solutions for mankind. Well, you know, Paul, the uh, the text the text says that it, it pleased the Father, but I think Mike is assuming the motive is penal substitutionary atonement that he was he got joy from crushing his son that it was it was the act of crushing that pleased him rather than what it was accomplishing, because as we noted, Isaiah fifty three is about healing, redemption, deliverance. It's motivated by the love of God, the unity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. The motive was God's love. It wasn't God's inability to forgive. It wasn't a, a need to satiate some warped view of divine justice where you punish the innocent and you let the guilty go. That's not what, what's accomplishing here. But it seems like it seems like Winger is taking a very literal interpretation applying the motives of penal substitution to that literal interpretation rather than actually considering what the text is saying and what the scriptures tell us was the motive behind that, 
which would tell us why it pleased God. Yes, if we chose to read Isaiah 53.10 in an absolutely wooden, literal manner, then God the Father is pleased to crush his son. Well, this raises all kinds of problems with their own theology, too, because most of their systematic theologians, apologists, and so forth, tell us that God is immutable. That means he doesn't have changeable emotions. Well, if God suddenly becomes pleased, that means at a prior time he was in a state of displeasure. I know that you and I may have some differences of opinion on that. So at this point, I'm just going to move on to the next clip because I don't want to end up starring in one of your infamous music videos. Uh, we're going to continue. Yeah, we're going to continue with Mike Winger's uh, analysis of Isaiah 53:10. This is clip 12P. Um, sorry, my phone jumped around. But I will say this: Isaiah 53:10, where it talks about how um, how it pleased God that. Part of this has to do with your understanding of God. If you if you allow the scripture to give you the concept of God as perfect and holy and just and good and righteous and every motive of his heart is good and right, if you have this solid understanding of God, when you hear that it pleased God, it will immediately dispel any images of a malicious God who's enjoying suffering or something wicked like that. Instead, you'll see this in the context of Jesus. This was, this was um, it, it achieved the accomplished thing to reconcile us to God. Warren, in the first interview you and I did in this series, we talked about something that Peter Kraft called God logic. God logic allows a person to reverse any kind of proposition simply by adding onto it the magical words, but God can do this. I'm afraid what we have here is another instance of God logic. So let me give real logic and we'll, we'll analyze based on the logic what Mike Winger said. Premise one, if God knowingly butchers an innocent in order to exonerate the guilty, then God is unjust. Premise two, God does knowingly butcher an innocent in order to exonerate the guilty. Conclusion, therefore God is unjust. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. That's called modus ponens or affirming the antecedent. It's a perfectly valid inference pattern. So Mike Winger has told us that God does indeed knowingly butcher an innocent in order to exonerate the guilty. But then that's not unjust because God can do this. God logic. All right, Mike Winger is a young fellow, so we can cut him some slack here. Unfortunately, even the elder statesmen of the atonement school do this kind of God logic thing. Paul Meyer is a highly esteemed apologist. He was one of the big guns that the apologetics industrial complex brought out when they had to fight off Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. It's always one fire after another with the apologetics industrial complex. You know, you would think that they could do something better with their time than just running around putting out fires. But here's Paul Meyer talking about John Dominic Crossan and refuting, quote unquote, Crossan's claims by invoking God logic. Well, John Dominic Crossan is an amazing person. He appears regularly on television, loves to rattle Christian cages. Jesus' body wasn't buried in Joseph's tomb. Dogs ate his bones, this kind of thing. So we would expect him to say something like that. And it just shows that Crossan is using human logic, but when it comes to God, we've got to use a higher divine logic in which, yes, it was not child abuse for God to have his son die in behalf of our sins. It's a higher dimension here that evidently Crossan has absolutely no, uh, no interest in. I think, Paul, I think the reason why they have to appeal to this sort of God logic is because they're recognizing an inherent disconnect in the Trinity within their atonement theory. So they're, they're having to, to fix this inherent clunkiness, this inherent uh, animosity or disconnect between father and son. And of course, Micah said that that's straw man, it's not true. And we've provided quote after quote after quote after quote in this series showing that's exactly the uh, the issue here. But I think they're having to imply or employ uh, God logic to, to get around this clunkiness, but then also um, to deal with this idea of uh, of this punitive rather than healing, this idea that, it, that God is the problem that needs to be reconciled to man, rather than men with their sin and rebellion need to be reconciled to God. And this idea that, that not that Jesus and God are, 
are, are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are unified and coming to, to heal, redeem, to teach, to restore, to accomplish this, but that Jesus is essentially saving us from the Father. And, and it, 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 all of these issues um, are, are so um, clunky and, and they, don't, they don't seem to fit very well. So the, the only way you can get around, well, this doesn't fit and this doesn't fit is to say, well, in the divine economy or whatever, somehow it works because it's God. And um, I just think that, that that's a, I think it's a cop out. I think, I think it's, I think it's, it's like um, uh, just raising the white flag and then still pronouncing victory because you raised a flag. I don't see that as, as a, um, a convincing handling at all. It is not convincing at all. And they are reduced to this because as you said, the basic facts that they espouse, when we lay out the facts as propositions, then infer the logical conclusion therefrom. It's a, it, it's a conclusion that they absolutely can't tolerate. So they have to employ God logic. You know, we talked about John Dominic Crossan in a previous, uh, previous interview. Even James White has had to give props to John Dominic Crossan. When James White debated N.T. Wright, James said, referred to John Dominic Crossan as a very intelligent man. You could tell there was probably a bit of trepidation to have to go up against somebody with that level of intellect. We have got to listen to people outside of the faith and see where we are falling down. One of the places where Christianity in the West is falling down is on PSA. Anybody who listens to this is uh, going to say this is child abuse or this is human sacrifice. When I was uh, getting ready to do these prep, when I was preparing to do these interviews about Mike Winger, I converted the videos to audio and I was listening to them in my car. The person who was driving with me one day as I was playing these, she, she after we, we finished the, the, uh, the, the audio recording, she goes, sounds like human sacrifice. And that's a person who had very little interest in this topic, is not very theologically involved, yet to this outsider, listening to a description of PSA is the same as listening to a description of an anthropologist talking about the Aztecs or the Maya. So they are they are reduced to God logic. And I'm sorry to say, even guys on the Western side of Christianity, whose work I really like, employ this tactic too. We're going to hear now from Steve Gregg, a, a man whose work I generally really like. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're the sinners. The sin was laid on Jesus. And he, of course, then was, he took the punishment for it in some way. Now, I don't want to go into great detail about the atonement and all the theories of the atonement because they are numerous. And because I think each of them gathers a little bit of the truth about it and that none of them alone fully uh, grasps it. And I personally don't believe that I fully grasp it. If someone says, well, how could God allow one person who's innocent die so that someone who's guilty is no longer considered guilty? You'd never have any parallel to that in a court of law. Though in a court of law, you might have somebody who owes a debt and can't pay it. It is paid by some benefactor and settles that score exactly which metaphor, the law court metaphor, the redemption metaphor, slave market metaphor, which one is closest to the heart of what happened in the atonement is greatly debated. And it, it stumbles certain people because they don't like the ramifications of this or that metaphor. But the point is, we don't fully understand all that went on in the councils of God. There are things in this that are mysterious. There are things that are not fully explained. They are hinted at through metaphors, but we don't know them. We don't have to. As C.S. Lewis said, people ate food and benefited from it for centuries before they had any theories about vitamins and nutrition. Modern science has told us some reason why food nourishes us, but people ate it and were nourished long before they had any theories about that. It's not the theories of the atonement that make it work. It's the fact people have been forgiven and justified by faith long before the doctrine of justification by faith was ever contemplated. God can justify people with faith because he understands it. That he understands the atonement is all that really matters. If we come to understand it some way, more power to us, but unnecessary. What's necessary is that we 
actually are justified by our faith in Christ, and God knows why. But what he did through Christ managed to cover the demands of some kind of justice so that he could not compromise his justice and still do what otherwise would seem unjust. He takes the criminal and transfers the criminal's guilt to something else, and, and, and it dies. And that's what the whole sacrificial system in the Old Testament was typifying. That for centuries, the Jews laid hands on an animal, confessed their sins, and symbolically, that animal became the sinner and it was sacrificed. Why that would work, who can say? But God instituted that so that we would understand that's what Jesus would do. He'd be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What God has explicitly told us is, he that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. That's from the book of Proverbs. That's what God explicitly tells us. He does not explicitly tell us atonement. But in that clip, Steve Gregg basically just assumed what he was trying to prove. He says, look, we have this doctrine of the atonement. I know it looks like injustice, but it can't possibly be injustice because this is the doctrine we have. And then he says, well, we don't understand it, but God understands it. In other words, God logic yet again. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a combination of God logic and appeal to mystery to pretty much lay a blanket over all of the inherent inconsistencies and contradictions and problems with this atonement theory. And I think it stems, and I may have mentioned this previously, I think it stems from more of a fear than it does uh, anything else. Because if if this is your understanding for the work of Christ, then to question this feels internally like you're questioning Christ and his work itself, rather than the way that you're understanding Christ and his work. Um, and that's that's a very hard thing to get your brain around. Is is it am I am I questioning Christ or am I questioning my understanding of the work of Christ? And I don't think that God logic or appeals to mystery um, are are uh, are a fine salve here. But I mean, there are places in Scripture. You and I would both agree on this. There are places in Scripture where we have to uh, resign ourselves to some degree of mystery. We're talking about the divine but not as a, as a blanket or as a cover for an inherent and obvious contradiction. And that's the problem that we're seeing here with, with penal substitution. But uh, Paul, do you have anything to add to that, sir? God works miracles. He does not work contradictions. Amen. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for joining us today as we've considered Isaiah 53. We've responded to some of the claims uh, that, that Mike has put out regarding this. Uh, I want to thank Paul uh, again for, for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. And um, continue to tune into the program. If you have not watched this series in its entirety, start over with episode one. Go all the way through it. This is a, a very uh, popular doctrine that we're responding to. It's consistently misrepresented. Whether, whether you believe Paul and myself or you believe Mike Winger, this doctrine is one that is often misrepresented. Um, we're saying that Mike in, in many cases is misrepresenting it. He's saying it's our side. And we hope that by presenting this balanced uh, response, that it'll be a blessing both to Mike and to his viewers. And so dear viewer, thank you for uh, joining us today, listening to us. And until next time, God bless. Take care. Please be sure to watch each episode in this series as we are responding to the claims Mike Winger put forward addressing the historicity and biblical basis of penal substitutionary atonement. Thanks for watching.